moments before. Yeah, fractions of a second. <laughs> The problem is with these things is they always show this big, long, glowing trail. Yeah. There's no atmosphere there. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like... It's the streaking from the light, you know, your eye, you know, following it down. All good? All good? Yeah. All right. I know it's the day, the, the Friday before spring break, so everybody's excited to go spend time at LPSC. At least that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> a little shout out there in the back. All right, it's my, my pleasure today to introduce um, Dr. Jeff Plesha, who, who's made the very long and arduous trek, I think it was two hours, to get down here this morning from, from, from Laurel, <laughs> Maryland, um, to talk to us today about the Chesapeake Bay structure, impact structure. So please give him a warm welcome, and I'll let Jeff take it away. The turn this thing on. Good? Okay. Um, all right, yeah, so I wanted to describe a little bit about the Chesapeake Bay impact structure, which um, just for those of you that don't know anything about it, uh, basically it's, it's centered here down in southern um, Maryland, northern Virginia, um, on the Delmarva Peninsula. The center of the structure is basically under the booming metropolis of Cape Charles, for any of you that have been there. Um, it's completely buried uh, subsurface. There's no, no obvious signature of it at the surface. Uh, it's about 85 or 90 kilometers in diameter, but the diameter is kind of a, f a funny number, and we'll come back to that. It's 35 million years old, give or take uh, a couple hundred thousand, um, depending on exactly what you date and how you date it, you get slightly different answers. Um, it's a complex impact structure. When it formed, uh, there was something like five or six or seven or maybe a kilometer of water here. It was off the eastern coast of North America. Uh, when it hit, the target consisted of the ocean, um, some unlithified sediment overlying crystalline basement. Um, the boloid, the thing that came in was, you know, on the order of, a, of three or four kilometers in diameter. And, and that size is, is more a function of how fast was it going, what was it made of, how dense was it. Um, you can sort of calculate what the energy of the event was, and then you can play games with the dimensions of the, the impactor. As far as the present understanding is it's not clear what kind of an impactor it was, whether it was a chondrite or an iron or something else. We don't really know that. Um, there, um, the whole event lasted like a minute uh, in terms of excavation, a little bit longer in terms of sloshing around of the, the water. Um, and there's really no indication that there was any kind of global environmental effect for it. And, and there's really not much of a signature uh, on land. If you were to look over here, um, no one's found any uh, sort of ejecta or tsunami deposits that would correlate with this thing. So it's kind of, a, of an odd structure. Uh, for those of you who don't want to take a field trip there, um, this, is, this is it. Um, there's a sign and, and that's about it. Um, as I said, everything is underwater or under land, so there's nothing to see. Um, it's, as I said, it's a, it's a complex in, impact crater. So this is Copernicus on the moon. This is a complex crater. And basically, I just wanted to point out the, the basic elements of a complex crater, which is a central uplift, uh, some sort of uh, trough around it, uh, a faulted margin. Uh, then you have the crater rim and then ejecta outside. And in the case of, of cr craters on land or on other planets, you get secondary debris that's flung out uh, long distances. So in a gross sense, um, the structure at Chesapeake Bay, um, there's the area around here that's unaffected. There's a margin here that has a series of faults inside. So it kind of looks like this faulted margin here. Uh, there's a, a deep trough here, which might correspond to this. And then there's a central peak in the middle. Um, and we'll come back to that in a second. So just in cross-section comparison, something like Meteor Crater is a simple crater, just a bowl-shaped object. Um, Chesapeake is complex, so there's this bump in the middle and faulted margins around the side. And then when you get up to b really big things like impact basins on the moon, um, you, get, you still get an uplift in the center and faulted margins, but the faulting goes out farther and begins to break up into a sort of periodicity. Okay, before the impact form and before anybody knew about it, uh, the view of the East Coast uh, was sort of like this, that there was a crystalline basement uh, left over uh, from the you know, earlier Precambrian, um, and that if you were just to draw a cross-section across any place 
on the East Coast, you'd see something that kind of looked like this, which is some faulted basement at depth and basically a continental margin sedimentation that's been going on uneventfully uh, since the rifting between uh, North America and, uh, and Africa. And, and that was kind of the idea. There had been studies on, on basement rocks and from drill holes and whatnot, but the view of the basement before the uh, crater was known was that there wasn't anything here. There were some granitic plutons and stuff that were indicated by gravity and whatnot, and, and some stuff off here in the Baltimore Canyon trough, uh, some, some thicker sedimentary sections. But basically, there was no indication that there was anything there. Okay, the discovery history is, is kind of interesting because it went on for quite a while. Um, under the, at least the land part of where the structure is, there's a very highly saline aquifer that doesn't belong there. Um, you know, typically there's some, some salt water, you know, down the, the stratigraphic dip uh, towards the ocean, but at a relatively shallow level, there is a very, very high um, salinity aquifer um, within what's now called the Exmoor Breccia. And people didn't really understand what that was doing there. Um, there, there were some early drill cores and, um, that brought up some material from the Exmoor and David Powers, who worked at the, works at the survey, looked at the stuff and said, well, maybe it's some kind of landslide deposit. Um, and, but he didn't really know. And then Wiley Pogue, who worked at the USGS up in Woods Hole, uh, was looking at some, some DSDP cores off the east coast of New Jersey out on the continental shelf and, and found that there were uh, foram nephril assemblages uh, in the core um, at a certain position that were kind of mixed up and also looked like the mixed up foram nephril assemblage that was found in the Exmoor Breccia. And um, that sort of got him to wondering what was going on and why there was this correlation between this unit down in the Chesapeake Bay and this layer off New Jersey. Um, so he started thinking about that. Um, subsequently, uh, some people looked at the Exmoor Breccia and found shock quartz in it. And shock quartz is a real indicator of, of an impact because you need very high pressures uh, and a very short time span to make these features. And then in the course of um, looking around off New Jersey, uh, this thing called the Tom's Canyon impact structure was suggested, which was a very small crater uh, on the continental shelf. So all this is, is churning away. And then Texaco had run a line down the middle of the bay and had a deep uh, seismic reflection section um, that finally came to light at the survey and sort of it all fell into place and they decided that, okay, there is in fact um, an impact crater there and it needs to be studied. The interesting thing about the Texaco section is when the guys from the USGS went to Texaco to ask for this stuff, they said, well, how far down the section do you want? And they said, well, at least down the basement. And so the guy took a pair of scissors out and cut the section <laughs> just above the basement contact. So there's this piece of paper, you know, they would never release the original data. It was a long, a long negotiation between the survey and Texaco, and I don't think they ever actually got the data. Uh, subsequently, there have been some additional lines run, but it's a standard industry thing. So the thing that was found off New Jersey is, is this is a piece of the core, um, and there was this layer in here that was all churned up and all kinds of weird stuff and, and had some, some odd chemistry. They found some small tectites in there um, and things, and so this is one of the key pieces of evidence to suggest that there was a nearby impact and then the correlation between the foraminiferal assemblages and the other data led them to the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so the event happened, um, courtesy of NSF. Um, there was a, was a big event. Um, it, it created the crater. It, it blew away the water. Uh, subsequently, the water all rushed back. And so you had a process that looked something like this, where you had excavation into, through the water column, through the sediments, and down into the crystalline basement. Everything got blown away uh, for a short period of time. And then after the sort of the excavation phase, all this water that had been blown away came rushing back. And what it did was essentially scour a huge area because the whole structure was offshore. So you had sort of azimuthal symmetry. It all came back and filled up the interior of the crater uh, that had been hollowed out um, with what is now called the Exmoor Breccia, which is just this loose material. Now, typically in an impact crater, um, there's a breccia, but it's a very lithified thing and there's all these pieces that are glued together with impact melt um, and it's, it's a real hard rock. This stuff, if you look at it in, the, in a core, it's like oatmeal. Um, there's, there's no lithification. Um, it's just sort of muddy and held together by the, the salt matrix. Uh, 
type of uh, debris produced by impact? The, the breccia is just a name for an assemblage of. Exmor. Oh, Exmor is the lith is a is a stratigraphic name that somebody gave to this material a long time ago before they understood what it was, and it's basically because it was. The, the original coring that was done was near the town of Exmoor, and that's where that name came from. That term is used for that type of deposit anywhere in the world? Breccia is. Exmoor, no. Exmoor is just this particular instance. Well, there are two, yeah, but are there are two instances, one off of New Jersey and one off of one on the Chesapeake Bay? There's one on the Chesapeake Bay. There's a small structure off New Jersey, yeah. So it's used for those two? Yeah. Um, this is what it looks like in, in cross-section. Um, here's the crystalline basement going to the east out into the ocean. Um, there was this thickening wedge of, of the blue stuff, the sediments that were there before the event happened. The event happened and, and deformed all the, the blue stuff and excavated it from the middle here. This yellowish stuff is the breccia. And then subsequently, uh, the post-impact sedimentation is this uh, green material. And now there's you know, shallow water in the bay, the Delmarva Peninsula, and then you go off into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, one of the questions was what happened after the event? Were there any sort of environmental effects? And to the best of anybody's understanding, the answer really is no. Um, there was obviously a local effect at the crater, um, and, and the chemistry was locally screwed up for a while. But in terms of a global effect, uh, there really wasn't anything. There is a drill core from the Southern Ocean. Um, sort of south of Africa and north of Antarctica, um, where people were looking at um, some isotopic records. And basically, during the 35 million years ago period, the temperature was slowly going down. Um, right at that boundary, there's a little bit of a, of a twitch in the, in the trajectory here. Maybe that had to do with the Chesapeake Bay impact. Maybe it didn't. But other than that, there's really no, there's no global extinction events. There's no big climate changes. It, uh, it didn't really have any kind of global effect, um, despite the fact that it is a fairly large event. OK, so what happened afterwards? You had this big hole in the ground, and it continued to collect sediment uh, for the last 35 million years. The, as part of the drilling project that we had several years ago, there was a large interest in people who had no, uh, an interest in the sedimentology and climatology aspects of, of the Earth and didn't really care about the fact that it was an impact. The nice thing for them was the fact that the section there is considerably thicker than it is outside, and so you got a much higher uh, precision record of what was going on. So there were some holes that were drilled, um, shallow holes around the, the central uplift, and then the, the deep hole was eventually drilled into the central uplift. And this just sort of illustrates the the stratigraphy that was recovered above the, after the impact, and, and all the, the typical units that, that are there and everywhere else along the East Coast are there. They're just much thicker. It's all sort of silica classic sediment. Um, there's no carbonates. The, the depth of the water at the time ranged anywhere from, from a few meters in some sort of lagoonal sediment to, to hundreds of meters offshore. So the sea level was sort of going up and down while this thing was sitting there accumulating. Um, sediment. But there's a nice, long, detailed uh, record here that um, is, is better than elsewhere along the East Coast. Um, the, the key points, though, is that um, this Chickahominy, which is the, the um, unit that's directly above the Exmoor Breccia that postdates the impact, um, is um, spatially coincident with the um, the crater and doesn't really have any expression outside. So it was, must have been the stuff that was filling in the hole immediately after the, um, the impact. You have a couple other ones where uh, the sediment rate seems to change and then this may reflect either a combination of sea level change rates or the rate of compaction of the material. Uh, but the, the sediment accumulation rate uh, varied uh, a couple times distinctly in the, in the time afterwards. Um, as I said, the um, the units are all thicker here, and the stuff in the Chickahominy, which is the unit that immediately postdates it, suggests there was a local issue. There was, it was either oxygen poor, or there's a lot of organic carbon around, um, and it was uh, sort of very different from what the rest of the Atlantic margin was doing at the time. But this is really the only um, environmental effect. OK, so if we start looking at the structure itself, again, here it is um, off the southern end of the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, it's about 85 or 90 kilometers across, measured from one side of the deformation to the other. As you can see from the, 
outline of where the structure is, most of the thing is under the bay or under the ocean, um, which made um, analyzing things very difficult. In terms of uh, drilling, typically you want to drill on land, so you were sort of limited to drilling here or on the eastern margin of the Virginia coastline here, but you're right along the edge of the structure. Um, a lot of the structure is, is, is largely inaccessible. On the other hand, uh, the fact that you're out in the bay here and off in the ocean did allow for some, some reasonably good seismic reflection profiles to be conducted so we can see what the structure is. Um, so like I said, the whole thing is, is like 85 or 90 kilometers across. Around the margin, and I'll show you this in some detail in a minute, are a series of concentric normal faults that, that deform the sediment. Um, then in the interior, there's something that's about 35 or 40 kilometers, which is a hole that was excavated into the crystalline basement. And it's got a little ring around it. And at the center of the structure, um, right here under Cape Charles, is about a 10 kilometer diameter central uplift that comes up. So you've got uh, a flat crystalline basement surface that goes down, and then it comes up in the middle. And then on top, you've got this broader area of deformation in the sediment. Um, one might imagine that, that there was a lot of ejecta and that you would have distributed this over much of the East Coast as far as the um, Gulf of Mexico or something, but there's no, um, th there's no exposures of anything. There's a place in, in Georgia where there's a sedimentary section exposed that has some geochemical anomalies in it in a real thin layer, but there's no, there's no equivalent, if you will, of the Exmoor breccia deposited anywhere on land that, that's been discovered yet. Okay, so here's the famous line. Here's the scissor mark. Um, so basically what this shows is this is running north-south on the west of the Delmarva Peninsula in the Chesapeake Bay. So it, it, uh, in this particular piece, begins within the crater, goes over the central trough and, and skirts the central uplift and then back across the lip. So here's the basement. Um, it comes up, there's a lip here, and then it drops off. And if, if we had the record, you would see it come down here it would come up here, go back down, come up and it, whoops. And then come up again. Um, but the, your, this profile is off the axis of the central uplift. So there are some reflectors up here that look like side swipes off the, the peak, but it didn't directly go over the peak. Um, you have this big zone in here of sort of chaotic reflectors this is all the Exmoor breccia, all that stuff that flowed back into the, into the hole after it, it formed. And then you have the, the post-impact uh, sedimentary section on top. Um, and you can see the, the bottom of it is not um, perfectly flat. The, the stuff has been compacting at slightly different rates. And so there's some little differences in the sediment thicknesses. There's some little local um, growth faults and, and folds up here in the sedimentary section as this stuff has kind of differentially compacted over the last 35 million years. Okay, so if we look at some of the stuff around the edge, um, here's part of a seismic line that crosses the edge of the structure. So you can see the post-impact sediments here, and then a series of reflectors that are, that are tilted here. And this is what the interpretation looks like where these tilted reflectors represent the sediments that were there at the time that were uh, faulted and, 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 and the faults dip in towards the section, but the interesting thing is these faults that form around the margin do not penetrate into the crystalline basement. They, they cut through the sedimentary section and stop, and essentially what you had was some sort of decolement along the boundary between the sedimentary section and the crystalline basement, where the stuff inside the crater just moved this way towards the center because you created a big hole here. Um, as I said, and the, the margin of, of the edge of it is a little irregular. In some places it's not really defined because there's no data there, but it's basically, you just come in and it drops off. There's not, a, there's not a crater rim, if you will. A lot of times on an impact crater, you see the topography come up to the, to the edge and then it goes down. In the case of, of this, um, it just is just flat and then it starts dropping down. And that's probably because the, the difference here is this stuff just moved in because of the void collected. So it just sort of broke away from the rest of the section and moved inland as opposed to being physically uplifted like you would normally get at a crater rim. Okay, the inner basin is, is carved into the crystalline basement. Um, and like I said, it's about 35, 40 kilometers wide. Um, there is a, a rim. This might be more analogous to a true uplifted rim 
that surrounds this, where the basement is uplifted here. It's, it's a couple hundred meters high. It's a few kilometers wide around the margin. And then you drop into the interior here. And then uh, the floor of this thing is about 10 or 20 kilometers wide. And there's, a, there's a, an uplift here in the center that's about 10 kilometers wide. Um, and the floor down here is, is, is one or two kilometers below the, the margin and, and sea level. So there's a, there's a big depression there. Um, and again, the central uplift is a piece of crystalline basement that's popped up in the middle. You can see the, the stratigraphy and, and the deformation off the east coast here. Here's the Delmarva Peninsula, the center of the structures over here. There's a couple lines here that are shown over here. This gray stuff is the pre-existing uh, sedimentary section. And then you, you cross the boundary of the, the crater rim, and then there's just this chaotic mass in the middle, and this is the... Uh, the equivalent of the Exmoor breccia that, that came in. If you were to look in, in, in detail, which we don't have in very many places, but if you compare this to um, other structures that are, were formed in a submarine environment, almost certainly what's, what's going on here is you would find places in the rim that essentially have been eroded through, and there probably are little channels that cut through the rim as this resurge came back in. It wouldn't have just flown nice simply over the thing. It would have developed some, some channeling. But because the, there's relatively you know, little coverage, I mean, there's a, a number of individual profiles, but um, we don't have sort of a continuous profile all the way around this to see where these little channels are. But if you look at other structures that look like this, um, you see those. So they almost certainly occur here. Um, so we, we had the seismic. And then um, a couple of years ago, they began drilling. Some of these wells were just water wells that were drilled. And then um, eventually, we drilled three holes here at Cape Charles, all of which were funded by a combination of the USGS, DOSEC, and some money from NASA to try to penetrate all the way through the structure and see what was going on. So in cross-section, if you will, you can kind of see where a lot of these holes are. Nothing really penetrates. There's only a couple that, that actually got to bedrock uh, before the hole we drilled. Um, but you can see this cross-section. Here's the basement. It goes down, and it pops up at, at Cape Charles here. Um, so as I said, the Exmoor breccia was known from, from water wells for quite a while, but, but no one had gotten through the, the whole section. So started back in um, 2005 and, and drilled into 2006. This was the structure on Cape Charles. Um, there were th three independent wells that were drilled. The first two were, were sort of test holes to recover the sediments that the shallow sediments that post-date the structure, and then um, got a much bigger rig that would drill down into the, into the deeper section, into the crystalline basement. Um, and so drilling went on 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, um, as long as everything was working. Um, and this is essentially the core composite that was recovered. So basically, at the core site, we had 444 uh, meters of this post-impact upper Eocene, the recent stuff. Then there's there's on the order of 600 meters of this Exmoor breccia, this stuff that came roaring back in. And then um, we hit this big piece of granite. And, and I had the, the great joy of being out there when we were drilling through this, where it, we, we would drill for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. You know, and, and eventually, um, they would say, well, I made another meter. Um, and then um, this stuff was incredibly hard. And then all of a sudden, it stopped. Nothing, would, we weren't getting any, any more uh, penetration. So they had to pull out you know, two kilometers of drill string. And the problem was is a piece of granite lodged in the bottom of the core, coring device. So they pull it all out, take the piece of rock out, put it all back in, took you know, the better part of a day. Um, and, we picked, and, and while this was going on, and um, as we were drilling through this thing, there really was a question about maybe we penetrated through the whole structure. Maybe we're done, and we're just in the granitic basement. I mean, it, you know, it was just, you know, typical deep seated granite. Didn't, you know, there were some fractures in it, but it didn't look any, anything. And at around the same time, we were starting to run out of money. So there was a concern about how much more we were going to be able to drill. Um, we finally got back in a hole and kept drilling and popped out of the bottom of this thing into this little, um, into a couple hundred meters of suavite, lithic impact breccia, melt, all the stuff that that you would expect to see at the bottom of a crater. So we realized um, that this is just a big clast, if you will, in this breccia. I mean, it's, um, it's a couple hundred meters across and probably as big sideways. And it just you know, got washed back in with all the other debris 
um, and we just happened to drill through it. And then eventually uh, we started drilling into what we really think is basement because it's, um, it's sort of altered and, and, and fractured and stuff. But it's, it's conceivable that this is still another class and that the real basement is down here. But this sort of thickness is consistent with the seismic data and, and stuff. So we think this is a, a reasonable section. So we got through the breccia and we got into the melt at the bottom. And so we can sort of figure out exactly what was going on. And this is what it was like sitting out there in the midnight shift at 2 in the morning while we're drilling through granite, just looking at each other. It got, it got to the point where um, they would bring up the core and we would look out the window to see what was going on rather than go outside. And so this is what the core looks like. Um, this is in the, the, it's kind of hard to see. This is in the, in the basement stuff and in the Exmoor breccia. You can see the breccia is composed of all kinds of stuff. It's not just sedimentary class. It's, it's basement class. It's sediment class. It's all kinds of stuff all mixed up into this melange of, of incoherent stuff. Um, and, and we drilled through, um, you know, most of these classes are pretty small. This is only a couple inches across. So most of these classes are pretty small. There were some meter-sized things in there as well, both, both crystalline rocks and sedimentary rocks. But this is what the stuff more or less looks like through the whole section. And at the bottom um, is the, is this, this is the basement rock. And um, in some places you can see that the basement rock has been shattered and impact melt has been injected into the shattered basement. So in, at least in this sense, um, we know that we're at the bottom. Um, it could have been that this was a little bit deformed and impact melt was ejected and it's still a boulder, but, but probably not. We're probably at the, the bottom of the structure at this point. All right, so what does this thing look like compared to, um, to some of the other structures um, around the world? So the top one is, uh, excuse me, is Chesapeake Bay. This is sort of leveled out, but you can see the, the basement structure. The, the red stuff is the breccia. This orange stuff is the stuff that was broken up. Um, this is a, this is a, a structure um, in the North Sea where you've got a similar sort of event where you've got a basement uplift and, and um, that was penetrated through a section of sedimentary uh, rock underwater. And then the whole thing is, is capped somewhat uh, by, um, by the breccia. In this case, the water was probably deeper, so you didn't quite have the same uh, big sloshing event to level everything out. And then in the case of the Tom Canyon structure, which is up off New Jersey, is much smaller. It's only a couple of kilometers across. There's, there's a little bit of uh, excavation and faulting in the underlying sediments that didn't go anywhere near the basement. Um, and then the interior is filled by this kind of loose material. The interesting thing about um, this structure is had this occurred on land in, in lith or in a place where the sediments were lithified, it would have only been about 40 kilometers in diameter. Um, the amount of energy is, is you would typically expect to excavate something like this. As I said, the reason it's so much bigger is because during the event when you excavated this, this hole, all the sediment just kind of sloughed in and, and, and broke up into pieces. Um, and it broke up, I mean, it was lithified enough to break up into some individual fault blocks, but the stuff was not, certainly not lithified like a normal rock. So it's, it's um, um, some, of the, some of the fault blocks are, are not well defined. Okay, so one of the other things we were trying to do to better understand the structure is to do some, some gravity uh, surveys. And um, this, we did this with ground surveys, not, not aircraft stuff. Um, one of the ways we tried to get around the fact that there was so much water that we really couldn't do anything is to go out and find these little sandbars that were exposed at low tide, make a measurement there, and so you knew what the elevation was because you knew what time it was. Um, other places we... Uh, you know, we use GPS to get an elevation sitting on a well here um, or a wander around in cornfields. Um, tried to get an elevation. Wherever we can get an elevation or, or a good GPS reading or something, we, we did, did a gravity uh, station to try to understand what was going on. Because as, you, as I said, most of the structure um, is offshore and so it's hard to get there. There is one marine gravity line in the bay, so we use that data as well. Um, and so. There's also uh, AeroMag over the, the area, but, and there is some kind of a magnetic anomaly associated with the central uplift. Uh, the interpretation that we made was it might be melt, but um, there's really very little data um, to support or to refute that, basically. And the gravity looks like, like this. So if you look at it in a sort of map projection, here's a Dalmarva Peninsula. Um, 
here's the coastline. There are lots of big anomalies in the area, and, and this is reflecting, this has nothing to do with the impact crater. It has to do with heterogeneity in the crystalline basement. And so you've got the blue stuff is low, the red stuff is high, so there's this big prong of high gravity coming down here. There's stuff over here underneath the uh, Virginia coastline. Uh, there's stuff out here under the Delmarva Peninsula. There's a big low up here in the northern Chesapeake Bay. Here's the structure down here. So all this stuff has nothing to do with the impact, which makes it much harder to try to figure out what to take out of the signal so you're understanding what's going on with the impact. So at a zoomed up level, here's what the, the gravity looks like. Um, again, here's this big central low. This corresponds to the inner basin. Basically the ring around the exterior where the, the sediments are faulted doesn't have a gravity signal. And that's because you basically took unlithified sediments, broke them up, and then put more unlithified sediments on top. So there's no density contrast to really produce an anomaly. Um, it's only in here where you've got, um, out here you've got crystal embasement at some depth, and down in here there's just the breccia filling it. So you get a gravity low here. So we tried to, to look at things and try to understand what it was. And again, this is another perspective. Basically, what we found is we could resolve the inner basin very well. We can, we can estimate what the, the depth of the floor of the basin is. We can determine how big the central uplift is. Um, and, and that's about it for, for the signature, because as I said, all this other stuff has nothing to do with the, the, the crater itself. It's a reflection of compositional variations in the bedrock. But we were, be able to, we were able to understand a lot about the interior, which is really what we were after anyway. Um, so in a very simple model, um, we, we made it something that looked like this. This is running up and down the, the Delmarva Peninsula. So you go uh, from offshore through the central uplift and, um, and then back into the sediment. And as I said, there's no density contrast between the unfaulted and faulted sediments out here. So there's really no gravity um, signal. Um, up underneath the Delmarva Peninsula, is, is this big gravity anomaly um, that is undefined by anything we've encountered. I mean, we don't know what it is. So in, in the, you know, any, any answer you want geophysics, um, there's a body down here to reproduce this. It has nothing to do with the structure itself, um, but basically what, what it shows is that the, the bedrock is more or less homogeneous. Um, there's a little bit of, of, of model dependency here. What you observe in places where they've drilled through deeply through an impact structure is the basement underneath the structure is, is faulted and, and shattered and the density is reduced. And, and so uh, we could trade how thick this, um, this lens is in the inner basin here. Uh, we can make it a little shallower if we, if we lowered the density of the material directly under the crater, which is, which is a legitimate thing to do. Um, in this case, we just used a constant density to get, to get an idea of how thick the, the, uh, the fill was. Um, we looked a little bit at the, um, the physical properties of the stuff in the core. Uh, the post-impact uh, sediments are all relatively low density. They're, they're siliciclastics. Um, they're not lithified. The Exmoor breccia is, is variable, and it has to do with the class content. You know, you make a measurement on a relatively small uh, size sample, and depending upon how much crystalline rock is in there or, or not in there, um, it varies over a couple tenths of a, of a cc. Um, in the, uh, the big granite block, um, there are variations sort of based on the lithology. It's, it's granite in quotes, but there are some lithologic variations, so the density varies uh, quite a bit. And then you get down in here into the melt, um, and there's a huge variation depending upon how much class material is there versus how much melt material is there. It's, a, it's just sort of a mixing ratio. The melt is relatively low density. The, the basement rocks are slightly higher. And then we, we have a few uh, samples uh, from the basement, which suggests that over you know 50 or meters or so, the the density is increasing. I don't know whether this is meaningful in terms of the the fractures going away with depth, or whether this is just you know noise in the system, if you will. Uh, there weren't that many samples. Um, some some people looked at the porosity, as you might imagine, the Exmoor breccia and the and the overlying sediments have a relatively high porosity. The granite has almost none, and um, the stuff down here. Has, has variable porosity depending upon how fractured it was. So that's basically the story of the, the Chicxulub impact structure um, and sort of how it was discovered and the implications for, for what it did or didn't do after the fact. Thanks.
I was a little unclear how you knew of the central peak because you initially showed the seismic line from Texaco that didn't Oh, have it. from the gravity. It's just oh, from okay. the gravity. I mean, okay. the, the seismic line, um, b sort of before the fact, um, the seismic line swiped it at the time. They didn't know it was there. So after the fact, you can see the side swipe. But the gravity um, pops up um, quite a bit in... in you can see this blue area here. So this is the trough around it and the gravity here. And you can see, you can see it on, you know, as you're coming down the peninsula um, towards the end here, you can see the gravity start to go up. And, and then, like I said, offshore um, in the bay, um, there is a marine gravity line. So we knew it went away. So it's largely on the basis of the gravity that we, we um, found the central uplift. Yeah. You said that it was chemical analysis said it was likely a combine. Do you know what kind of analysis no. they did? No, um, we had that discussion this morning. I, I don't remember. Um, I mean, typically people look at, you know, the elemental composition in the in the melt and try to um, make some inferences. I I just remember reading something somewhere and and I tried to find it um, and I couldn't. But as my recollection was, it wasn't definitive. But is there any evidence of secondary craters? Secondary? Craters? No. There's no evidence of anything. I mean, you, you would expect there to have been a significant ejected deposited around this. You would have expected um, a tsunami deposit on the coast. You would expect, you might not expect secondaries, maybe. I mean, you, the stuff down deep, the granitic material would have been coherent enough to be transported if it got out of the crater. The sediment would have probably broken up and it would have just made a, a splash somewhere. There's, there's no evidence for anything outside the crater, which is one of the, the odd things about this. Now, it may have been that the, the water was, was deep enough that, that it essentially precluded a lot of stuff getting launched out um, uh, you know, in, in a ballistic trajectory. I mean, typically you get the equivalent of an explosion and the stuff gets ejected. The fact that there's water there, I, may have had something to do with it, but there's really, there's very little evidence outside of, you know, there are some little layers in the marine cores, you know, from stuff settling out, but not, not like a big ejecta layer somewhere. Right. Certainly nothing like the KT boundary. Are there other water impacts to compare? Yeah, there are, um, there are a few. Um, and, and in those cases, the problem is you, well, the, a lot of the stuff was discovered by uh, oil process, you know, oil, reconnaissance, they see some structure in the reflection and they investigate it. And so there's not a lot of, of samples outside the area to figure out if there's a lot of ejecta or stuff. I mean, Chicxulub, the big event, the KT boundary, there's ejecta everywhere. I mean, you can go to, to Italy, up to you know Canada, all over the Caribbean and the South America, and you can see visible layers of ejecta. Uh, that's much bigger. Um, and and, and maybe, maybe there's a for a marine impact, maybe there's a threshold that you got to be so big before you can ignore the water, if you will. I happened to read this morning <laughs> an article in an AGU publication about the Eocene and Oligocene boundary, which okay. is been dated at exactly 35 million years. And that's exactly the age of this crater. And it's, it's a time in Earth where there is a transition in the sedimentation regime, the environment. Are there other craters? It's just, it's just a coincidence, or are there other craters of uh, this age that have been identified elsewhere? Um, there, there's a similar age crater called Papagai in the Soviet Union. Um, the, the, the pro I'm, not, I'm not sure there's anything else close. There's a fair amount of, there's a bunch of craters that really are very poorly age dated because there's no melt to date, and so they're looking at some kind of stratigraphic context. I don't know offhand of any others at 35 million years. Um, I'm sorry? Is the Tom's River one the same age? No, it's, it's younger. Um, the, um, you know, this sort of goes to the periodicity thing, too. You know, there are people who argue about periodicities and people who don't argue about it, and, uh, um, I don't know. Um, you said that there were no global implications, but 
Uh, when you showed the uh, isotope data, it yep. seemed to me there was some oxygen isotope discontinuity. Yeah, I, there is something there, but it's it's from a single core. So the question is, is you know, is it really related to this crater, or is it just coincident? I mean, it, it's certainly nothing like the KT boundary, you know, where you can see a clear environmental signal everywhere. Yeah, but you've got a smaller bolides. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can't kill the dinosaurs twice. No. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, maybe there was an effect, but I haven't come across anything to really see people argue for it. Well, it, it does seem to me that if, if there is an oxygen isotope discontinuity, that that's got to be a global effect. Yeah, but uh, I'm getting way out of my field now. I mean, apparently the temperature was cooling already. Um, and I don't know how consistent that was. Uh, you know, maybe there maybe there are other blips in the thing that don't mean anything to anybody because nothing else happened at that point. Um, I I haven't followed that very carefully. Yeah. This article. Okay. <laughs> uh, it said there were extinctions associated with this boundary. Yeah. There were what? Extinctions associated with this boundary, and it marks the beginning of the formation of the Antarctic ice sheet. So that it is a distinctive boundary in the geologic record. And apart from this, it just seems that this hits it exactly. Is somehow uh, something to think of them. Well, I have to, I have to, who wrote the article? Do you remember? I, I saw Neos. Okay, I have to look. I, today. Today. All right. Well, I'm, I'm one publication behind. <laughs> I'm a geophysicist. What answer would you like? <laughs> Maybe there's, there's un undiscovered um, impacts at the same time. Maybe this is related to that. So I've got a question. Your this sort of related to that. Is there any relationship with the Carolina Bays? Yeah. Somebody else asked that. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, the Carolina Bays, whatever, whatever they are, are recent. I mean, you can see them. Um, as far as I know, the the... Impact crater in communities canonical view is there's nothing. There's not an impact there. Um, there's no other than their semicircular depressions. That's it. Um, there's no evidence for for impact morphology. There's there's no deposits. Um, I haven't looked at them personally, but my understanding is that um, there's not. I mean, they would have to have to have been fairly low angle because they're not. You know, they are elliptical. Um, you could imagine a scenario to make them, but I, I don't know that anyone's found any definitive evidence. And they look exactly like the thermal karst depressions in the Arctic coastal plains. There are no big mysteries. Sorry, my bad. So, so I, you know, really um, that that pops up periodically, and and but no one's ever definitively proven it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there are round things that, that people have suggested are impact craters. And um, in a few cases, they turn out to be. In a lot of cases, it's, it's some sort of structure or, um, um, you know, a pluton or, or something else. There's, a, in fact, um, going to, flying to California, um, a lot of times I fly through Dallas. And as you go from Dallas to the West Coast, you go over this beautiful circular thing in the middle of nowhere. And I always wonder what it was, and it turns out it's just a—it's in a volcanic area, and it's a, just essentially a lacolith. Um, you know, I went so finally I went there one time to see what was going on, and it's just, you know, uh, up tilted domical sediments. Um, and if you look at Hudson's Bay, I mean, the east side of Hudson's Bay is this nice circular feature, and if you look at the Belcher Islands, which are out on the in the bay, the structure is sort of concentric, but. That's it. There's no, the other, there's no other half to the thing, so it's not a, and there's no other evidence for an impact. Yeah. It seems kind of odd that that crater is headed right at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Could that, in some way, have contributed to the fact that that's where the mouth is? Y yes and no. Um, the the mouth is where it is now because the Delmarva Peninsula has crept south over time because of longshore transport. Um, it's sort of like just like Cape May in New Jersey, but there's always been because the sediments within the crater are compacting more than they are outside. There's always been a depression here, and so a lot of stuff comes out and comes this way. Um, 
and, and it's acted sort of as a, as a locus. But I think if you were to sit around for another million years, that, you know, it would just keep going and close off the bay or whatever. But it just happened to be there at this instant. At this, yeah. I mean, because if you go down the peninsula, um, you can see there are old channels cut through the, the unit. And, and uh, you know, it gets progressively older as you go, I mean, younger as you come south. So about the issue of gravity profiling. How difficult is that to do? And it would be worth just, if you got ships sailing around, why not equip them with a gravity meter and just get readings from the whole ocean because all the ships are traveling anyway? Is that ridiculous or practical or how in between? You, you could, I mean, you could put a, there's two ways to do it. One is you have a gravity meter on the ship and, and there's a whole bunch of, of mechanisms to compensate for the motion of the ship. The other thing is actually put a gravimeter on the bottom, which is a much bigger production. Um, they're very expensive. They're very... Um, hmm? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I mean, they measure sea surface temperature on ships everywhere they go, but um, I, I think doing gravity would be uh, much, pro much more prohibitive. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you have a target of interest, then you know, you would go out and do that. Um, but I think, I think you could probably, you know, it would be interesting, but I think it's too expensive. All right. I've got one more question yep. for you. So, if people look at the velocity, I mean, we have sort of an idea of the momentum that may have been parted, right? But could you have like a, a low velocity, massive thing, or more of a splat? Than a, than a, yeah, you, you could. I mean, the um, you know typical velocity is you know ten or fifteen or twenty kilometers a second. Um, from the size of the thing, you can, as I said, you can sort of estimate the energy, and you just go back to kinetic energy, and you can trade the mass and the velocity back and forth. Um, you know, it had to have enough <clears throat> cohesion that it made it through the atmosphere and, and effectively through the water column. The to excavate into the the crystalline basement, um, and and the size of the um, well, it's a circular argument. Um, so it had to be coherent enough like that. Um, but I mean, there's no. I don't think you could tell from looking at the structure that it, whether it was an iron, so it would be small, or whether it was some kind of low density chondrite. 